Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we're going to have a great awakening time today, for sure. This is going to be something that will warm your heart. <laughs> I'm broadcasting to you from uh, the Living Miracles Monastery here in Utah, where we have a minus two degrees Fahrenheit <laughs> day going on here. So uh, we're, we're going to keep our hearts warm, though, in feeding your heart with the truth and inspiring ideas that will lift you higher and higher and higher in awareness to to happiness, to joy. So, well, it's interesting. Uh, today we're going to have a movie that is basically over 99% animated till the very end. And uh, I always say that after we have a series of pretty intense, serious movies, I like to come back to some animation. And I like to always come back to humor. Jesus tells us in A Course in Miracles, the world will end in laughter because it was a place of sorrow. How's that for the end of the world? <laughs> laughter, the world will end in laughter. And this movie has a lot of uh, humor in it, a lot of wit. Um, it's deep, it's profound, and yet it's, it's also very fast-paced and fast-moving. So I don't think there's one single lull in the movie. Uh, this is a fast-paced animated movie that will take you on a ride. But it's the kind of ride that all of us want to go on because we want to be happy. So, as usual, you voted for uh, for your themes, and the top theme that you voted for this week, which is what our movie was, will take us into, is coming into true honesty, being aligned with the Source in all I think and say and do. And the second theme was accepting I am perfect just the way I am. Those two themes will, will guide us today as we move through this movie because we want to live an honest life and we want to feel we're lined up with our source because our source is, is love and our source is happiness and joy and peace. And that's really in our heart, that's what we're praying for. We really want to have a very happy, joyful life. And in order to stay aligned with the Source, we do have to accept ourselves as we were created by God. The ego made the body, the ego made the personality, the ego made the perceptual world of time and space, it made the stars and the planets, and the mountains and the trees, the ego projected a world that was meant to be a hiding place, as Jesus says in the Course, a place where God could enter not. Uh, the world was made as a veil to cover over our true identity as pure love. Um, the world was made as a distractive device to distract us from going within and finding the love within our, our hearts, and the world was made as a place of hatred and sorrow, and many of us have gone through a lot of experiences that were pretty difficult, pretty uh, dark experiences, but Jesus is saying not to worry, you just had a misperception, and uh, I will help you correct your perception, and then you'll see things truly, and you'll know that you were just mistaken about the world. The third theme that was voted on is don't be fooled by the tricks of the ego. The fourth theme is facing the belief in loss. And finally, the last one is seeing that giving and receiving are the same. So, this movie is, we're going to see today is called the Lego Movie. 
Uh, is anybody familiar with, uh, with the children's toy called Legos? Uh, these are little building block toys, yes, uh, where you can build things and build all kinds of things and and that's kind of uh, pretty symbolic of this world. This is a world where there's a lot of building. Uh, Jesus tells us in the Course, he tells us that you learned this world and you kept building on and adding on uh, complexity on top of complexity on top of complexity. You learned a world of images that has no reality whatsoever and you never really paused to, to ask, why am I doing all this building? <laughs> and Jesus is saying, well, you forgot that you were created perfect, and so instead of accepting your perfection, you decided to become a builder. And some of us have put so much energy and effort into building that we've tried to become master builders. You see, that's what you try to do when you're off on a, in a world of illusions and you're trying to overcome deep feelings of unworthiness and lack, sadness, sorrow, hatred, all kinds of dark emotions, you, the ego says, well, why don't you compensate and make it a little more fascinating and interesting. You can become a builder and if you really work hard, you be, can become a master builder. And uh, people try to build wealth, they try to build fame, popularity, they try to build success in all kinds of crazy ways. And yet, I think, I believe it's uh, William Shakespeare that said it best, uh, the world is much ado about nothing. Uh, with, in this world, we become masters of nothing. <laughs> we, we, we don't know who we are if we identify with this world and the images of this world. And so, we think that we can become good at something, but really we're just slip sliding away, like the Simon and Garfunkel song. Believe we're nearing our destination, but, but in fact we're really just slip sliding away. So, this world is a trap. When, when I mentioned one of the uh, themes was don't be fooled by the tricks of the ego, every image that seems to be a separate image in time and space is a trick of the ego. Tricks are not here and there. The whole perceptual world is a trick. Jesus tells us in the Course, he says, a son of God can only be happy in the environment in which the son of God was created. Well, that that is heaven. God created us as spirit and we can only be purely happy in heaven and nowhere else, because there is nowhere else. Heaven is reality. Spirit is reality and the images of the cosmos are fictitious. They're, they have no reality whatsoever. Uh, in a couple weeks I'm going to show an amazing movie uh, called Einstein and Eddington, where it'll take quantum physics all the way into a whole different perception of this world and using Einstein's theory of relativity show that everything in the cosmos is relative. Gravity is relative, space is relative, time is relative. Everything you can think of, knowledge in this world is relative, the human body is relative, countries are relative, uh, and even physics, uh, as we'll call it, Newtonian physics, are all relative. And there's only one absolute, and that absolute is God. <laughs> God is the only thing that can be known. And, and uh, who you are as a creation of God is tied into that. So, this movie is called The Lego Movie, and some of you might remember the theme song from The Lego Movie, Everything is awesome. Everything is cool when you're part of a team. Everything is awesome when you're living the dream. And today Jesus was saying, well, I can give you a reinterpretation of that. Uh, everything is awesome. Everything is awesome when you're part of a team. I asked Jesus, what team am I a part of? And he said, you're a part of the Holy Trinity, and that's the only team that counts. There's no other team that counts. 
There is no other team except the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost. They're all spirit. And every other team in terms of earth is just a fictitious, it's a projection of the idea of team because there are no teams in this world that you can identify with. You should have no loyalties for anything of this world. You should have no attachments to anything of this world. You should remember you're a creation of an eternal God who created you perfect in eternity and and that team of the Holy Spirit, we'll call it, is is the part of a team where everything is awesome. And that's the only way the awesome word applies into spirit, to eternity. And then he said, and everything is cool when you're dreaming the dream. Don't try to live out your dreams in this world. You were not created for time and space. You were not created to build an environment or an identity in time and space. There is nothing of this world that means anything. That's lesson number one. Nothing I see means anything. And you are only going to be happy when you realize who you are in spirit. Partial happiness is not happiness. And you can have glimmers and, and bits and pieces of happiness, but you will only be happy in, in spirit. So, now, I, some of you remember about 1999, let's roll back the clock. Does anybody remember what movie came out in 1999 that kind of got our attention? The Matrix. The Matrix. Why was everyone so fascinated with The Matrix? Because it was a parable of awakening. It was a parable of you are the one. It was a parable that you can transcend duality, transcend multiplicity, transcend every form of fear and guilt and pain and shame, and have dominion over the world as the one, as the one who has forgiven the world. So we all remember Neo and remember Morpheus and Trinity. Well, about 15 years later was 2014, and I remember I was just marveling at the movies were coming out in 2014. I said, wait a minute, this is 15 years after The Matrix. Interstellar, 2014. God's Not Dead, 2014. The Theory of Everything, uh, 2014. Divergent, Lucy, The Maze Runner, The Giver, and on and on and on. I'm like, oh my God, the floodgates are breaking here. We, we started off with the Matrix, and now the Holy Spirit is streaming through, streaming through to reach us in a point where we're ready to wake up from this dream. And this movie, this movie we're going to watch today, the Lego movies, was also there in 2014. I remember I went into a movie theater with some friends of mine and we walked, it was like a discount movie theater, and I could not believe how many Awakening movies were in the theater. I walked through that theater and I was like, oh my God, there's like 10 Awakening movies in the theater in 2014. And we just kind of went between one theater to the next. <clears throat> and I was out in the hallway and a, and a mother and a father had brought their little boy, I think he was about eight years old, and um, the father said, well, I'm going to see the Lego movie. And the little boy said, I think I, I want to see that, Dad. And his dad said, okay, come with me. And the mom said, I don't think the Lego movie is for you. Well, I just was watching the scene because I thought, here this little boy has a choice whether to follow his dad into one of these profound <laughs> awakening movies or not, at eight years old. And it was just a beautiful scene to watch because when our mind is ready, we start calling forth witnesses to spiritual awakening. And that's what activates our awakening, is our desire to, to experience the truth, to let go of the lies. 
to let go of all the things that, that distracted us from knowing God. And now it's time to wake up. This is our big wake up call. So we're going to watch the Lego movie. Uh, this is The Matrix, only it's made into a, an animated movie, so even kids can follow the Lego movie. That's right. Uh, and also, The Matrix, I have to say, The Matrix was not really a comedy. There were not really very many comedy scenes in The Matrix. Not so with this movie. This is made for the children. We're all children wanting to wake up to know our creator, and this movie is packed full of humor. It's just, I mean, every scene is loaded with humor. This is so great to have a wake-up movie with animated characters, Lego characters, and it's got superheroes in it. it, it it's a parody on this whole world. I have never seen a movie that pokes fun at this world so much as this movie. It pokes fun at, at business, it, uh, with Mr. Business being the main uh, character. It pokes fun at time, where Mr. Business is all about profits, about making more, and basically Mr. Business wants to freeze the world, freeze the world in the past. It does. Mr. Business doesn't like innovation, doesn't like change. Uh, Mr. Business just likes pain and suffering and guilt and wants to freeze the whole world with the, the fraggle. <laughs> and basically the fraggle uh, is basically, it's basically super glue. <laughs> uh, it's basically super glue where some of the letters have been taken out. So the ego is always trying to freeze our mind into the past. Anytime anyone accuses you of something, they're trying to freeze your mind into the past instead of witnessing the presence of the holy instant. Anytime somebody is pointing out grievances to you, something that went wrong in the past, something that you're you're locked into based on the past, that's the ego. And in this movie, uh, we're going to see that that is what Mr. Business is trying to do. He's trying to end the world by freezing it. <laughs> so if the ego could just take a snapshot of this world, it would just say, you are the past, you are the separation, you are the guilt, and there's nothing you can do to escape. But the Holy Spirit is the voice of happiness, of sanity, of collaboration, of let's join together. Let's remember the truth of who we really are. Let's remember that God didn't create us for this world, that this world was made up by the ego to cover over who we really are. And, and that we should invest in nothing of this world. Uh, that's how you escape from fear. That's how you escape from pain. Now, we're not saying that the world is bad or the world is good. To the Holy Spirit, the world is neutral and it's just a group of symbols that can be used to reinterpret the world into the forgiven world or the happy dream. So there's nothing good or bad in this world, but the ego tries to judge aspects of this world as good and bad because it keeps the separation, it keeps the perceptual problem going in awareness. And once you realize the world is not what it seems and never has been what it seems, then, then you're ready to escape the world and see the world differently. So when we look at this world, and I know everybody is wanting to to lift this heaviness from their heart, this heaviness of, of being identified as a human being. And the two main ways that the ego tries to reinforce a bodily identity is either to accentuate individuality, to accentuate the autonomy of the personality self, 
to accentuate the belief that you as a person can be a hero. And what Jesus is telling us is the hero of the dream is the body. Heroes don't escape. Heroes are distractions. Superheroes, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, all the superheroes, Mighty Mouse, <laughs> there's a lot of superheroes. One thing we know about superheroes is they're always into saving bodies. <laughs> Superman is always trying to save bodies. Batman, Batgirl, all of them are trying to save bodies and Jesus is telling us, no, no, no. The body is not in need of saving, it's your mind. Your mind is sleeping and dreaming and it's perceiving a, a hallucination of a world and that world is not real. It's your mind that needs the help. It's your mind that needs salvation. Your body does not need salvation. You don't need superheroes. Superheroes are an invention by the ego to put yourself to distract on something else, to cheer for someone and root for the superhero to defeat the evil, the evil ones. Jesus is telling us there aren't any good guys and bad guys. There are no heroes and, and uh, evil people in the world. It's all a projection of the ego to keep you from going inside and forgiving the entire world because God didn't create anything of this world. The whole perceptual world is a perceptual temper tantrum. It's a perceptual nightmare. There's no way to escape it through heroes. And that's why Jesus has the hero of the dream section in his, uh, his text, because he's saying the serial adventures of the body is, is what the hero of the dream is about. So in this movie, what we're going to see is it's, it's a world of conformity. It's a world of people pleasing. The Lego movie is, uh, um, it's called Bricksburg. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the name of the place is, Bricksburg, is the Lego world. And this world is entirely built, just like this world that we perceive with our five senses is entirely built. It's also a world of conformity, of rules, where you're supposed to fit in, and the way that you're supposed to be happy is by following the rules and fitting in. Has anybody here tried to follow the rules of this world? Okay, Don, there we go. Don's got his hand. Do we have any rebels? Do I have do I see any rebels? Ricky, get that hand up there. I we've got rebels and we got conformists here. And the ego doesn't care which way you go because if you rebel against the world, you still believe it's real and if you conform to the world, you still believe it's real. So the ego doesn't care whether you rebel or conform because its world is made on false rules. And if you fight against the rules or you obey the rules, the God didn't create the world's rules. God didn't create gravity. God didn't create time. God didn't create space. God didn't create the laws of physics. You know, for every action, there's a reaction. Guess what? God didn't create economics. <laughs> God didn't create the laws of medicine. God didn't create the laws of nutrition. God didn't create the laws of interpersonal relationships. That's right. If you believe in the laws of this world, you're in for a stressful ride. It's going to be fraught with guilt because the rules and the laws of this world were made up by the ego, and the ego is guilt. The ego itself is guilt. It's a death wish. If we follow the laws of this world, we're following a death wish. Why would we be surprised if we're upset if we, if we follow the rules of a death wish? You know, why would we be surprised? So, Emmett, he's our main character. Emmett is... He's our little yellow Mr. Lego, and he 
he just follows the rules. He tries to follow all the rules to be a good person. He tries to exercise. He tries to eat right. He tries to obey all the rules of the world. And what we'll notice that he's he doesn't really have friends. Uh, he's so busy people-pleasing with the world that Basically, Emmett is just trying to fit in. He believes to be happy is to fit into this world. And this is what we would call people pleasing to the max. Okay, he's trying to conform to the world and to be happy by conforming to the world. Well, he's going to have some things happen to him where he is actually going to be part of a prophecy of of waking up and transcending the world. And the prophecy will be that he is the he's going to be called the special. Okay. Our main character in the movie Emmett is is going to be the special. And some of you are saying, well that how does that fit with the course in miracles? Jesus says, isn't he telling us that specialness is the problem? No, Jesus says in the Chorus, all my brothers are special. You see, it's saying everyone is precious because everyone is equally the same and underneath the forms is the Holy Child of God. So Jesus actually says in the Chorus, all my brothers are special. And in this movie, the prophecy is that Emmett is the special because he's going to discover what's called the peace of resistance, P-I-E-C-E, -E, the little part of resistance. And it's buried deep down in the earth. Now, how does this relate to what we're talking about? For us, with the mind asleep, we all have a part in our mind that's buried very deep in our mind, and that part is a, is a piece of resistance. And the resistance is to the light. The resistance is to who we really are. So everyone who comes to time and space has a resistance to remember that they're really perfect, that they're really pure love. And the human being is an outpicturing of this piece of resistance. This is the part of your mind that would rather sleep than to be awake. This is this is the part of the mind that would rather judge than be at peace. This is the part of the mind that would rather have imprisonment instead of true freedom. It's a little piece of resistance and it's so pushed out of awareness that this little piece of resistance is unconscious now. It's, it's, it's out of awareness. So when you wake up in the morning and you brush your teeth and you you know, you have a shower and you get dressed and you go about your day, this resistant part of the mind is so afraid of the light that it would prefer to hide in the darkness than to, than to be given over to, to the light. Uh, Jesus says in the Course that this little part of resistance, this little belief in separation, he says, it doesn't belong to you. Give it back. In other words, Jesus is encouraging us to give our piece of resistance back to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Imagine if you had it in your hands and Jesus said, you don't want that. <laughs> you don't want that resistance. You need to give that to the Holy Spirit because you'll be really happy when you give the resistance over. But while you hold on to the resistance, you you are choosing to be miserable. You are choosing to be less than wholly happy. So in the movie, Emmett, there's a prophecy that Emmett will find the piece of resistance. And when Emmett does, the piece of resistance is going to stick to his back. <laughs> What does that mean? The piece of resistance is sticking to his back. It means that he's in for a wild ride because when you make a decision not to dissociate or forget the resistance 
And rather to face it, rather to call on the Holy Spirit to face the resistance in the mind, you are actually on your way to heaven. You are, you are going to remember heaven because you're not trying to hide the resistance. Every day when you wake up, you're saying to the Holy Spirit, bring it on. Let me face my resistance to love. And wow, I can tell you it's a rocky ride. You know, if we thought we had a pretty nice life, wow, hold on, hold on to your hat when you, when you start to face your resistances because that's how you, you break free from the resistances. That's a, that's a, as Ricky would say, that's a ride of a lifetime. That's a ride of a lifetime when you face the resistance, when you're not going to try to pretend that it's not there, but you're going to say, bring it on. Bring it on. I want to face it. Now, basically, Emmett starts off with a very, very structured life. His everything in his apartment is completely structured. He goes to work every day as a construction worker. He basically doesn't have any close friends, but he tries to cheer himself up with popular songs. He goes, <clears throat> he goes to the Legoland version of Starbucks and has his $37 coffee every day. And when the, the woman at the coffee shop says that'll be $37, he just goes, awesome! <laughs> you see, he accepts crazy things because his world has now become the acceptable world. Don't laugh. Someday we may be paying $37 for a Starbucks coffee. It's it's not that far away. <laughs> but the choice is whether you just take it and spend the $37 and go, awesome, or whether you start to question your need for a $37 coffee. <laughs> you see, we always have a choice. We, don't, we always have a choice of the world we see, what we think we need, what we think we want. So, when we go into this movie, we're going to see that Emmett will discover uh, the peace of resistance. He doesn't know what it's about, but uh, in this movie, Morgan Freeman plays the voice of Vitruvius. You know, like Morpheus was there in the Matrix to help guide Neo? Vitruvius Morgan Freeman always ends up playing God or the Holy Spirit or <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's an animated movie. He's always the, he's always the voice of wisdom. But this is the funny Morgan Freeman. This is the comical one where they're going to poke fun at gurus. They're going to poke fun at everything. It's a parody on this whole world. They're going to poke fun at the spiritual journey. They're actually going to poke fun and make a pro... The, a, a, a joke out of the spiritual journey. But that's why you got to love this movie, because it's starting to, to teach you, remember to laugh. Don't take anything serious. Don't take anything serious in this world. That's what this movie is really showing us. Yes, there's superheroes. Batman's in it. Uh, Su Superman's in it. Um, the Green Lantern's in it. Uh, all the a lot of the the superheroes are, are in it. Sha Shaquille O'Neal, <laughs> Shaquille O'Neal is in this movie. Uh, the the Shaq is in the movie because it's going to blend all the different characters of time and space, and it's going to say that even if you have had seemingly success in this world, maybe. Maybe you've developed your skills and and maybe you have some very highly developed skills. And in this world, uh, in the Lego world, you would be called a master builder. Some of us have learned how to develop skills in time and space. And we've learned how to use the skills with the power of our mind to make what we believe is good in this world. Although the Holy Spirit knows nothing is good or bad. It's all just neutral. 
So in this world, the manifestors, I'm going to use the word manifestors, okay? We'll use a new age term. In this movie, the manifestors are the master builders. They can use the power of their mind to build things in many different ways and shapes. But it still doesn't make them happy. Uh, all the master builders are still not happy because remember, this is a world of illusions. So what does it mean to build something in a world of illusions? It means nothing. It means like you've, you've just demonstrated to yourself, you can use your skills to make nothing. <laughs> you can try to convince yourself it's something, but really it's still nothing. But when you bring all of these characters together, all the superheroes, all the characters, and they start to actually collaborate for a greater good that's beyond each and every one of them, then you start to get in towards a forgiven world. And that's why, even though each of us have different skills and abilities, it's not until we give them to the Holy Spirit to use that they really start to bring happiness in our life. Because the Holy Spirit is like the symphony conductor that can use all the skills of the ego to point toward the light. And that's what this movie is really about. It's not about trying to defeat an enemy, which much of our movies, you know, they're always about the, the good ones facing the bad ones, and do the good ones defeat the evil ones? This movie is not about that. This movie is about collaboration. Because the one thing about superheroes is they they usually operate very autonomously. And, and they're always trying to save people. But this movie is about learning to collaborate so that you can let your mind be saved by the Holy Spirit. And, and that's what the first two themes are really about. Coming into true honesty, being aligned with the Source in all I think, say, and do, and accepting I am perfect just the way I am. When we say accepting I'm perfect just the way I am, that's talking about our spirit. That's not talking about our personality selves. That's talking about our spirit. That's what's perfect. The body and all of its uh, serial adventures are just opportunities for us to let go of identification with the body and to really serve happiness or to serve God's will. So I think you're in for a beautiful ride today. I remember when I first saw this movie in the theater, I was just, I just had a big smile on my face because I, I went, what a trip. Um, this is, this is a modern day animated spiritual awakening movie that emphasizes collaboration over competition, that emphasizes joining over pride, that emphasizes um, spiritual awakening over success in terms of the world. This is a movie that emphasizes humor over seriousness. <laughs> and we need a lot of movies like that. We've had some pretty intense movies recently, so Jesus won't only let me show three or four uh, real intense movies when he's got to come back to the comedy. Jesus is a comedian. He's, he's always telling us, don't take anything of this world serious, because nothing here is serious. Everything is light and lighthearted. If you can see it with the Holy Spirit, you will laugh when you see it with the Holy Spirit. So enjoy the ride today with Emmett, and I'll pop in from time to time, and I think we're going to have a good laugh. The, the, the parodies and the jokes are just throughout the whole movie. Uh, you can just see how Jesus is poking fun at this world, and he's telling us, don't forget to laugh. Okay, so I'll see you soon. So, so basically, the purpose of this world is to have you adapt and adjust to it. 
to lose your Christ identity by adapting and adjusting to a lie. The ego made the world, the ego made everything of this world without exception, and if you feel depressed, it's because you have given over your mind to follow rules that God didn't create, to defend against uh, dangers that God didn't create, to protect yourself against something that seems real but isn't really real. Because the identity of a body, of a person, and all of the rules of economics, of medicine, of being liked, of knowing the right people, of being popular, of being, of, of everything, even of relationships, you know. The ego is constantly saying, you, how are your relationships? And if your relationships aren't fulfilling, then the ego says, you aren't fulfilling. So this is a world made to project unworthiness and reinforce unworthiness. It's a world of competition. It's a world of keeping up with other people. It's a world of comparison. It's a world of, of you better strive for success because if you're not successful, you won't be valuable. It's an entirely fake world. And to the extent that you believe in it and participate in it with your mind, it just reinforces unworthiness because this is the ego's world, this projected world of fragmentation. So the world, the ego will try to say, try to be as cheerful as you can. So he's singing his song, everything is awesome when you're part of a team. And he's trying to join with his co-workers and they're interested in, in sausages and sports and all kinds of, of different things. And they really aren't interested in him. And he wants to belong. He so much wants to fit into this projected world. And even at home, he watches silly TV shows. Has any of us watched silly TV shows when we were growing up? I watched a lot of very silly TV shows. <laughs> I can I can go through the whole list of them. He's watching uh, something, some TV show about with your pants off. That's what he does for his entertainment. He sings his popular song, Everything is Awesome. He tries to follow all the rules, but he doesn't have any real heart-to-heart -heart relationships. His co-workers don't really have a connection with him and he doesn't, he wishes he did have a connection that was much more deeper and much more meaningful, but he's not finding that connection. He's trying to use the distractions of the world to fend off loneliness, to fend off alienation. And, and I think you can all recognize that this is what this world is about. Underneath the mask of personality, people are really deep down, they're very lonely inside. They, they want more intimacy. They want more connection. They want the feeling of love. And it seems to be a desperate attempt because there's so many distractions about money and possessions and all types of attempting to find connection and intimacy through things that were made not to foster this intimacy and connection. They were made as distractions. So it's, it's a world of sound bites. It's a world of many, many images, many, many noises. And the deep desire, the calling of the heart is for true intimacy. That intimacy comes through collaboration, through miracles, and through serving and aligning with God. Through the, through the Spirit. And when we do that, we start to draw forth witnesses to our desire to wake up. We start to draw forth witnesses to our true desire to collaborate. Now, he's going to have an experience now where he's going to see something that he doesn't understand. And he's going to see a little blur of something moving and 
all he knows is it's against the rules. <laughs> he's so he's so obedient to the rules that he's going to see something and it's going to be Lucy. Here comes Lucy, just like the same year the movie Lucy came out with Scarlett Johansson. And Lucy is going to be searching for the peace of resistance. She's going to be searching for that that little piece of resistance that's been buried deep in the ground and it's been pushed out of awareness because everyone who walks this world doesn't realize that they're trying to hide their resistance away. They're trying to keep the resistance out of awareness. Because as soon as this resistance comes into awareness, then you have to face it and you have to forgive it. And this is a world of distractions where people don't want to face the resistance. They don't want to face the fear. They would rather be distracted by the images than face the fear of going within. And so Lucy's going to be searching for the piece of resistance and then Emmett will actually come face to face with the piece of resistance. And <clears throat> if you listen carefully, you'll be able to hear the angels as he gets closer to the piece of resistance. You'll hear the soft voice of the angels going, touch it, touch it, touch the piece of resistance. The angels are encouraging him to touch it, like face it. It's been buried from awareness, but don't be afraid of it. You can face this resistance that you have. And if you do, you'll realize that you were resisting God. <laughs> you were resisting Christ. You were resisting who you really are. And this is, this is a very important part of the movie because this is the prophecy that Vis Vitruvius told Lord Business at the beginning. There'll be a, a normal looking guy with a yellow face and he will be the one, the special one, that will find the piece of resistance and he's going to have to face that resistance for all of us. He's doing that as a, as a metaphor for the whole human race and for all of Legoland too. Okay, well what we're seeing here is that <clears throat> Emmett has just discovered the piece of resistance, and that would be in, in terms of what we're talking about. When you start feeling, you start feeling upset, but you can't find a reason in this world why you're not happy. You, you know, the ego is telling you you should be happy because of this and this and that, but but when you start to encounter the piece of resistance in your own mind, you're starting to go deeper. And we saw that in, in order for, uh, for Emmett to discover the piece of resistance, he had to take a very deep fall down a very, very deep pit with lots of bangs and bruises. <laughs> he got, he banged and bruised and banged and bruised and he went way, way down and there was the piece of resistance, like deep in the mind. And this resistance is so covered over by learning. It's covered over by everything that we learn about this world. Who we are, where we are, what we are. All of the self-concepts of this world were made to cover over this piece of resistance because once you start to get past all of these false self-concepts in your mind, then you actually have to start to face, wow, I'm resistant to letting go. I'm re res resistant to letting go of this world. I just did a podcast yesterday and this man uh, who was interviewing me, he, he wrote to me and he said, I really want to have you on my first podcast, but I'm a little scared of you. I said, I'm a little afraid of you. I've been watching your videos and listening to for years and I'm afraid I'm going to have to give up something important uh, is what it seems to be when I, when I think of you or talk to you and now I'm going to have you on a podcast. It's almost like this is a big step in my life because I'm going to have to face something and I don't even know 
what I'm afraid of. He said, it's all Gary Renard's fault, he said, for writing a book called The Disappearance of the Universe, because now I'm afraid of the disappearance <laughs> of the universe. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I don't know what's next. If the world goes away, what's, what's in it for me? You know, what's there? So God, to the mind that's asleep and dreaming, God is the big question mark. God is, God is what is feared. Jesus is telling us in the Course, you think you're afraid of things happening in this world that are disasters. You, you think you're afraid of death of the body, but actually your greatest fear is fear of redemption. You're afraid of God in the worst way possible. You are terrified of God because you think God will cost you your identity, your individual identity, your personality identity, all your personal friends, your personal family, your personal pet, your personal house. That little piece of resistance is the fear of God. And that is, that's why it's so buried. It's way, way, way down in the mind. You may think you're resistant to certain people. Like you may say, well, when I, whenever I'm around so-and-so, they rub me the wrong way. And Jesus is laughing going, no, you're not really resisting the character. You're, there's a resistance in your mind that you're not facing that's way down there. And you need to face that piece of resistance. You need to end the dissociation with this ego belief. You can't bury the ego and pretend it's gone. You have to actually face it and see, I made this choice, but now I can make a better one. I can, I can make a choice for healing instead of for guilt. A choice for happiness instead of for sadness. A choice for innocence instead of uh, guilt. And, and yet, that is so buried. Now, once he finds it, that's the, it's like the fulfillment of the prophecy. Now, Emmet has found the piece of resistance, and as soon as he wakes up the next day, he thinks he's going to wake up in his apartment, but he's facing good cop, bad cop. <clears throat> you might recognize that famous voice. It's the voice of Liam Nielsen uh, playing good cop, bad cop. And uh, a very distinctive voice. But good cop, bad cop represents human beings in general. You know, everybody's got a part. The face of innocence is what Jesus calls it. And that face of innocence is what you like to think of as the nice self. The good self and the nice self. That's good cop. And then bad cop is, oh wow, it's, <laughs> it's dark. That's why good cop was made. To be the nice girl, to be the nice guy, the good guy, the good girl. To cover over that wretched, dark <laughs> self that, you know, we call the shadow. Sometimes we know our shadow comes out. And it's not not very pretty. We, we go, uh-oh, it's you again. <laughs> you know, here comes the unconscious mind. So, so good cop, bad cop is just basically interrogating him because good cop, bad cop is the person, the cop, who works for Mr. Business. Remember, Mr. Business wants to destroy, end the world by freezing it. <laughs> and it wants to freeze any sense of change because the ego is afraid that the mind will change its mind and remember the Christ. So the ego is just trying to freeze the world into the past, freeze the world into guilt, freeze the world into shame, and make it so dark that it's like, that's the, its version of eternal hell. Uh, just freeze the guilt so there's no escape from it. And Emmett is now just discovering that he is now have the, the piece of resistance is hooked to his back. <clears throat> which is just symbolic of every day us facing that piece of resistance in our mind and saying, you know, it's not really about what's going on in the world. Uh, you know, in world's terms, it's 2022. We've just gone through a pandemic. 
We've just gone through, uh, we still have a war in Ukraine going on, and this is pretty typical for the projected world. War, plague, uh, economic inflation's high, economic struggles. This is how the world was set up uh, to, to be full of distractions to keep you from finding the peace within. But in this movie, we're seeing that it, it's a very important thing that's happened that Emmett is fulfilling the prophecy of seemingly being just an ordinary guy who now is facing his piece of resistance that's deep down in the mind. And once he does this, people show up to accuse him. They're torturing him. They're trying to melt little Emmett the Lego. They're trying to melt him, you see? because he's come so close to the peace of resistance. This is where the ego is afraid, because if you get close to that peace of resistance in your mind, and you actually do face it and forgive it, game over. Game over for this world. If you face the resistance, you've heard the saying, what you resist persists. As long as you bury the resistance and you keep it out of awareness, then you seem to see a world where resistance persists. But once you face it with the Holy Spirit, game over for the ego. This is where you wake up and you have your happy dream. Because in the happy dream, there is no resistance to anything or anyone. You, in the happy dream, everyone is equally acceptable. Or as Jesus says, everyone is, all my brothers are special, he says in the Course. Kind of flips the specialness around and says, well, specialness is just judging one person is better than another. But all my brothers are special, meaning all of them are precious, because we're all created by the same God. So let's see what happens. Now we're going to see Lucy come as a mighty companion to join with Emmett to try to fulfill the prophecy. Okay, so very much like the Matrix, when Trinity uh, he has all these skills, you know, her uh, martial arts skills, she can fly a helicopter, Trinity's great on a uh, motorcycle, and, and Trinity is sent in because she believes Morpheus and the prophecy, just like Lucy here believes Vitruvius and the pro prophecy that the special one will find the piece of resistance and save the whole realm. <laughs> okay, so there's a lot of parallels to the Matrix here. But when she turns back to him and says, you know, you're the one, you're the one in the prophecy, do you, you see the look on his face? <laughs> That's kind of like Neo <laughs> in The Matrix when when he's told that he's the one by other people, you know, or, or even people hint at it. He kind of gets the same look on his face like, am I? And that's part of the way that it goes. You start working with the Course in Miracles and basically Jesus is telling you, you're the one. And then... There's a part of your mind that believes in the, the resistance that's going, are you sure? <laughs> is, is this book for me? Is this, is, am I supposed to be reading this book? <laughs> you're, you're saying that I'm the one? <laughs> and Jesus is saying, yes, indeed. But you have to go through mind training. And that's what Emmett will have to go through now, too, because he seems to be surrounded by Lucy, for example, as a master builder. You saw the, uh, the the motorcycle that she built out of spare parts in the alley. <laughs> this huge, magnificent motorcycle. But this is the beginning of starting to realize that the master builders are just people that have skills that can be used when they're redirected for the whole. Skills don't have any value for human beings in and of themselves, because the human being is an artificial construct. It's a personality self that God didn't create. So 
The two ways that the ego tries to fool the mind is, first of all, focusing on the autonomous individual or the collective, the society, you see. Some people go for the society. They're all about preventing wars, preventing world hunger, preventing nuclear proliferation. They're all about the big global issues. And then other people are all just concerned about the personality self. You know, what's in it for me? What, what will improve my personality? What will grow my personality? And Jesus is telling us, no, wait a minute, the societal, the collective is a construct, and so is the personal, the individual. So it's impossible, even though we probably, how many here have read self-help books? You know, self-help books at the library. The problem is, the self that can be helped is the ego. <laughs> and the self that God created you is already perfect, and it doesn't need any help. <laughs> you see? So even self-help becomes a trap to try to build a better autonomous person that's more functioning, more, more fully functioning. And what the Holy Spirit is saying is, no, don't, don't try to... He never tells us to go for the body's betterment in A Course in Miracles. He always is saying, no, try this one. I am not a body. I am free. I am still as God created me. He's not one for small self-improvement. He's not one for small self-betterment. He's not one for autonomy or for the society because Jesus knows that both the personal self and the societal self, so to speak, are both illusions. And that in this world, we try to gain self-worth by collaborating in an ego sense with other bodies. When really it's just the Holy Spirit saying, let me use the body to bring you to a unified experience of mind. Because there's only one mind. In the end, when you... If you starts off with collaborating with people, like we'll see in this movie, but the whole point of collaboration is to reestablish your connection with God, with the Holy Spirit. And the true collaboration is always with the Holy Spirit. So when you want to collaborate, that's when you pray. You pray to the Holy Spirit and you say, tell me what to say, what to do. Lead me, guide me, direct me. Because the Holy Spirit is the communication link with God. And the Holy Spirit offers collaborations, miracles, instructions, guidance. And that is what frees the mind from the belief in this world. So we're at the beginning stages for, for Emmett, and now Lucy has appeared. Soon we're going to see Vitruvius, like the, the Morpheus character. And we're going to see a bunch of other people used, superheroes used in collaboration. But the key thing to remember is everything starts with the prayer of your heart. If you want to truly collaborate, you just pray for it. And then you let the Holy Spirit show everything that you need. All the people will show up that, that will help reflect this new purpose. But you don't have to seek for the collaboration in the form. You pray to the Holy Spirit for the collaboration, and then you just allow the form to show up. And, and you just accept whatever shows up as a perfect answer to the prayer of your heart. So, now you're, you're beginning to see from this movie that <clears throat> the ego has one purpose as a death wish, and that's to keep things or the world the way it's supposed to be. And what exactly is the ego's way that it's supposed to be? Separation. Fragmentation. The entire world was made to reinforce separation. All of time and space, all of time and space was made by the ego to reinforce the belief in separation. Without exception. So, you know, Jesus tells us in the Course, he says, the world was made in hatred. Look at that sentence. The world was made in hatred. 
Look at the sentence where Jesus says, the world was made as an attack upon God, a place where God can enter not. Look at what Jesus is teaching us. He's teaching us that the projected world of linear images of time and space, the cosmos, was made by the ego as a lie to cover itself in the mind, to, to come up with this plan that things need to be a certain way. And think about any time you get upset, isn't the upset is because of the belief that things should be different. If somebody should have spoken differently, someone should have been kinder, someone should have smiled at us instead of frown. Uh, all the outcomes of the world, it doesn't matter what they seem to be, the problem is the belief in the mind that things should be different than they are. And what is the solution? The Holy Spirit teaches, let all things be exactly as they are. All things work together for good. There are no exceptions except in the ego's judgment. So the main thing that that Mr. Business or, or Lord Business is trying to do in this movie is he doesn't like that there's master builders. He doesn't like freedom of expression. Uh, of course, the ego does not like freedom of expression because God created us as the Christ. And in heaven, which is our natural condition, we have continuous freedom of expression. I know you're all saying, well, that would be fun if I could just have continuous freedom of expression with no limitation whatsoever. And that's God is like, yeah, that's right. That's my will for you. I created you to be a being that had unlimited expression of love. Unlimited expression of love. Now, when you believe in the ego, which is the belief in separation, you believe in a world of limits. You believe in a world of false laws that God didn't create. You believe that there's limits in every direction you look. And sometimes you, you look at the body and you think, hmm, is this all that there is? I mean, I've had some people tell me, you know, we'll just be sitting talking and they say, I just wish for, I just wish for once I could get out of this skin. <laughs> they, they tell me, I wish I could get out of this skin. And I say, well, it's not that you're really in it, but it's the perception that you're in it. <laughs> that's the that's the hard thing. Jesus is saying, no, you're not really a body, and you're not even in a body. Once you realize you're the Christ, you realize you were never in a body. You just were hallucinating <laughs> this uh, whole body image thing. It was never real. It was never true. It was never eternal. It was never what God created. So, in this movie, what we're starting to see is that Emmett has still got a lot of doubts. You know, when when Lucy's uh, on the motorcycle with him, and then the flying the flying uh, spaceship, she says, you know, what's your favorite restaurant? And he says, any chain restaurant. <laughs> right away, she's like, oh no, <laughs> any chain restaurant is your favorite restaurant. And what's your favorite, uh, what's your favorite TV show? He says, where are my pants? <laughs> and she's like thinking, uh-oh, is this really the, uh, is this the, is this going to be the savior of the world? Who Any, any uh, chain restaurant is the favorite restaurant. And then she says, what is your favorite song? And he says, everything is awesome. And then she goes, you're not, <laughs> you're not the special. You know, and and then she totally loses her faith in the pole prophecy because she's and this is what happens when we start to evaluate the messenger. <laughs> Whenever we evaluate the messenger, we start to pick up bits and pieces from the past and we start to go, This cannot be the messenger. <laughs> this is this is not going to be the messenger, you know. Always poke holes, the ego will find holes in even the messenger. But this is where we have to expand our faith. So now 
they're in this western town now. It looks a little bit like Moab, Moab, Utah, with the with the arch. But this is where they're supposed to hook up with Vitru Vitruvius, you know, which is our Morgan Freeman uh, wise character who 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 had the prophecy. And this is going to be the beginning of learning to develop faith and trust because, because in the end, it's not going to be a body that's going to be our savior. It's going to be a new way of thinking and a new way of perceiving the world which is the savior. Even with Christians, sometimes they put Jesus as the savior, but, but the savior is the Christ mind. It's the Christ state of being. That's the Savior. It's not a man who lived 2,000 years ago. That was just part of an illusion, part of a demonstration, but that, that's still the past. And, and this state of being is right now. It's who we are right now is, is the Christ. So there's a long way to go, but right now you could just say with, with Lucy, who has, uh, basically revealed her her name uh and and he he kept repeating it over and over but uh she's she's the she's got wild in her name and yet lucy means uh means peace and and love and so that's she wants to go into the prophecy and know her real self and so does emmet but as long as the ego belief system is still in the mind, then there's going to be doubt, self-doubt. And that's what they keep reflecting to each other. And this, what Jesus would say, this is the time for faith. <laughs> don't, don't dismiss your brother and your sister just because of some doubt thoughts that come up from time to time. Don't dismiss that. Well, let's see. Well, we have a technical issue. I don't want to miss this great opportunity. <laughs> but uh, there are no mistakes. We can see that Mr. Business is, is just acting out the ego's wish for control. It, he lives in a super high high rise with his office at the top of this big building, which he says his assistants are saying the price of coffee is going higher and higher. Good. Build a, build a, bi a bigger roof. He's, he's building his Tower of Babylon higher and higher in the sky based on his $37 coffees. He goes in and he puts on fake legs to make him look bigger than he is. Kind of like in The Wizard of Oz. You know, in The Wizard of Oz, they have that projection of that big forehead and that that big creature on the screen, so that Dorothy and her friends are afraid. But it's it's not really the wizard. The wizard's just projecting a scary image. And that's what uh, Mr. Business is doing. Also, Taco Tuesday is the time when he's going to freeze the world, end the world. So he's, he's making it sound inviting, like, oh, Taco Tuesday, everybody come for tacos, and I'll kill you all uh, on Taco Tuesday. And his purpose is to use the, the craggle, the crazy glue, to freeze everything because he cannot stand things being different. To Mr. Business, free thinking is chaos. So he's trying to freeze everybody into his own expectations of what they should be. There's no creativity. There's no fluidity. There's no allowance for what we would call in heaven free will. All of us were created with free will. So in heaven, we have e eternal extending capabilities. We were created to extend love. That's all we do, we might say, or that's all we, we our, our, our function is creation, is extending as God extends in spirit. So in this world, <clears throat> the ego is always trying to freeze down everything of the world to freeze the past into place. It's like in the Bible when uh, they were escaping and uh, Lot's wife was told, don't look back or you'll turn into a pillar of salt. And she fell for the temptation and she did turn into a pillar of salt. 
I always took that as symbolic that if we turn and focus on the past, we freeze our mind into the past. And our mind was not created to, to, to be that way. It was created as a being of light, not to be frozen in time. So that's the, the main thing we've got going on in this movie. President business or Lord business is just showing the ego's desire to control, to order, to organize based on its own wish for separation. And then the whole point is to release our mind from that wish because that that ego wish to be separate is, is not is not our will. It's not it's not God's will for us. Okay. Let's see if we've Pete and the and the gang have got our movie back. <laughs> I think we're back. Okay. So what we're seeing here is that the escape from this world will not work if it involves attack and defense. All the he's been brought there by Vitruvius to give a talk in front of all the master builders, all the superheroes, and they're hoping to hear a plan where they can somehow attack Lord Business and defeat Lord Business. But this is the the plot of most of movies where it's the it's the the ones that try to overthrow the evil one through power and strength. And this is a scene that's basically showing it's not going to work. I mean, Batman basically, uh, when he can't escape, he says, every man for himself. Um, all the attempts at using strength to overcome evil, uh, will not work. And that's why when Jesus came to this earth, a lot of the apostles and a lot of his followers believed that he was the Jewish Messiah that was come to overcome the Romans. And basically that's still on the horizontal plane, attack and defense. And what Jesus was teaching, he says, the only way that you, you transcend the ego is not by fighting it, not by killing it, not by trying to destroy it in a battle, but by looking at it and exposing it. So that is how the resistance, the piece of resistance in the mind is overcome. You have to allow the resistance into awareness. It doesn't feel comfortable when you start to allow this resistance to come into awareness. It can take many, many forms but it's just the ego coming up into awareness from the unconscious mind. And so they, they basically when Vitruvius has brought uh, Emmett there, basically all the superheroes and the master builders are, are wondering what his qualifications are. And he doesn't have any qualifications to lead them in the way that they would expect a leader to be. Uh, and I think we could say the same thing with with Jesus. When Jesus came along, there, there were a lot of expectations that the apostles expressed. There were a lot of expectations seemingly swirling around him. And he was not coming to overcome anything in the world, but to forgive the world and basically teach that this realm of time and space is not a real realm. <laughs> talk about <laughs> talk about a different message <laughs> than uh, was expected from the Jewish Messiah. Uh, instead of coming to overthrow the Romans, he was basically coming to say, God is real, love is real, who we are is real, and this world is not. And you have to forgive the world. So you can see that's a very, very, very different message than was expected. And and it's happening in this movie too, where Emmett, you know, Emmett is saying, I don't, I'm not a master builder. Uh, and so he cannot build things the way the superheroes and the other master builders can. 
it must be that he will have a different function because throughout the ages, even those who have fought against evil have have seemed to suffer their losses. Even in the Marvel universe, uh, you have those those uh, the good ones against the bad ones, and uh, most of the time the good ones win, and occasionally <laughs> it flips around. But what what we're being shown here by Emmett is there is no way that you can find happiness and peace by overcoming something in the dream. You have to go into your mind much deeper to realize it's a dream before you can be free of it. So it doesn't do any good trying to attack or defend. It doesn't do any good to make people wrong. It doesn't do any good to put people down or to raise people up. <laughs> you know, that's the part of uh, superheroes. Raising superheroes up throughout the comic books, it's always been the superheroes are the ones that save the day. But really, they don't save the day because the problem isn't in the world. The problem isn't with evil people or evil lords or evil kingdoms. The problem is the belief in the reality of the world, and the world is only set free in the mind by forgiving it, by seeing that whatever you believe the world was, either positive or negative, was a judgment. Positive is a judgment, negative is a judgment. Now, they, they just went to cloud cuckoo land, and uh, they were told up there the neg negativity is forgiven, is, is basically forbidden. Negativity is forbidden. So everybody has to think positive. Has anyone tried the power of positive thinking? <laughs> you know, it's like you try to think positive, and the ego's like, "Yeah, right." Like the ego's like, "Do you know who I am? <laughs> you positive thinker." Because what Jesus is teaching us is we need to forgive even positive and negative thinking because. The positive is just the flip side of the negative, you see? And Jesus is saying, empty your mind. The same thing Buddha said, empty your mind. The same thing Ramana Maharshi said, empty your mind. That whenever you look at the past, you have to forgive the good as well as forgive the bad. Recently on Facebook, I, I made a post where I said something like, uh, you know, what if this moment is the only moment there is, and there never actually was a past that preceded this moment? And right away I, I had a comment was, but but I have good memories from the past <laughs> that I don't want to let go of. You see, that's the problem right there. Even the good memories, Jesus tells us, are are just shadows of the truth. And what we would call our bad memories, Jesus would say, those are dark shadows. <laughs> so the good memories are just shadows, and the bad memories are dark shadows. And Jesus is saying, let go of the shadows <laughs> completely. Don't think that anything you saw was showing you the truth, because anything of the past, whether you sugarcoat it or whether you you think it's dark, it's still veiling over the truth. I know Jesus is more of a, a Bachman Turner Overdrive fan. You ain't seen nothing yet. Bump, bump, ba ba baby, you just ain't seen nothing yet. Bump, bump, here's something you're never gonna forget. Bump, bump, you know, Jesus likes that song from Bachman Turner Overdrive because he's telling us the vision of Christ is nothing like the past. You ain't seen nothing yet. You have to forgive the good. You have to forgive the bad. Don't think the good of the past is real because it's just the flip side of the bad of the past and it's still shadow land. And Jesus is saying, we are children of light. We are children of God. We were created by God. We are pure light and, and nothing but light. And, and therefore the shadows are not 
our reality. So Emmett is going to come more and more to realize that if he is going to succeed, which the prophecy is, is that he will succeed, he is going to have to do more than defeat Lord Business, because that's the old style, trying to defeat evil. That's the old fairy tales, always trying to good triumphing over evil. And there has to be another solution. And Emmett is, is the one who's prophesied to find to be that solution. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay. All right, now the final commentary. How did we get <laughs> to that point? Well, the perceptual world, you know how I always say the, the world is just a perceptual problem. And the, the correction of a perceptual problem, guess where it is? It's in the mind. That's right. You know, when, when Einstein discovered that everything of the cosmos was, was interconnected, that time was not separate from space, was not separate from gravity, was not separate from motion. If you take what Einstein discovered and you start to expand that, you start to realize that nothing that you perceive in the entire cosmos is separate from anything else. And the only reason it seems to have different parts that interact in different ways and equations is because they're all thoughts in the mind. So the, the world that you perceive is just a projection of consciousness, down to the tiniest electron and to the biggest black hole, the biggest star, the biggest quasar. And so here's what Jesus tells us in Lesson 152, which is, the power of decision is my own. He says, nothing occurs but represents your wish, and nothing is omitted that you choose. Here is your world, complete in all its details. Here is its whole reality for you, and it is only here salvation is. You may believe that this position is extreme and too inclusive to be true, Yet can truth have exceptions? If you have the gift of everything, can loss be real? Can pain be part of peace or grief of joy? Can fear and sickness enter in a mind where love and perfect holiness abide? Truth must be all-inclusive if it be the truth at all. Accept no opposites and no exceptions. Now, what Jesus is telling us is, that nothing has ever, ever occurred in this world. And to believe that it has is to believe that you can break it up into good things and bad things. But in reality, it takes just an acceptance in the mind to see that it cannot be that truth involves good and bad. It cannot be that truth involves deciding between images and saying some are good, some are bad, some are real, some are not. It's all in the mind. And at any instant you decide, at any single instant you decide that it's all the same, <laughs> then you are free of it. But only by believing in differences, only by believing that there's a reality to differences, is what distorted perception is. That's why I always say it's a perceptual problem. It's not an interpersonal relationship problem. It's not a health issue. It's not a political issue. It's not a, a, a sexual orientation issue. It's not anything at all that it seems to include opposites. The answer is seeing the impossibility of the opposites. And that's what the mind training of A Course in Miracles is for. That's what Lesson 152 is for. The power of decision is my own. 
if I perceive an enemy, then I have misperceived. That's why Jesus taught 2,000 years ago, love your enemies, you know, bless those that persecute you. He was just teaching that this world is, is a hallucination of differences and all you have to do is train your mind to realize how impossible such a world could be. Why would a God of love create a world of differences? <laughs> so instead of accepting differences as real, instead of taking a perspective of trying to embrace differences, why not go for the ultimate solution, which is to see their absolute impossibility? All differences are a misperception. And that's why healed perception just sees the sameness of everything. It just sees the sameness of everything. It doesn't attempt to divide the world into parts, because there are no parts. The whole transcends the parts, the perspective of the parts. So, it's a pretty deep lesson. Obviously, it's the only lesson there is, but it's the lesson where you you can, you don't have to resist evil, you just have to see the impossibility of it. God didn't create it, and therefore it doesn't have a reality. And that's what all the mind training of A Course in Miracles is, is a day-to-day, moment-by-moment, to live the experience of see no error, see no differences. Do not acknowledge what is not real. <laughs> That's the first lesson of A Course in Miracles. So, I hope you enjoyed it. That was a, a very uh, different kind of movie. <laughs> we always come up with something. And then I will say, if, if you enjoyed this one, next week is, is, next Saturday is Christmas Eve, so I'll be down in Florida. Instead of minus two, degrees here. I'll be down in the, on the coast of Florida next week, and I'm going to show a Christmas movie, a miraculous Christmas movie next week. And then if you want, if you're in for the final day of the year, I'm going to show this amazing movie I just saw a couple nights ago called uh, Einstein and Edison, where we get to go deep into the mind of Einstein, where he discovers that that there are no absolutes in the world, that time is not an absolute, that space is not an absolute, that gravity is not an absolute, that there is nothing in the cosmos that's an absolute, because guess what? God is the only absolute! <laughs> and thank heavens! <laughs> everything else is relative because everything is based on distorted perception. So you don't have to try to figure out the distorted perception, you just have to let it go. And that's the, that's what we'll discuss on the final day of 2022. <laughs> so I see uh, Nuria there, probably from over there in Europe, uh, in Spain. And um, Nuria has written in from Barcelona. Hello David, this morning I took a card with this Bible quote from Jesus. Quote, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And then Nuria writes, And then this movie feels like a powerful synchronicity. I loved it. And the commentary, thank you. I want to be like little children too. This is my prayer to shake off limitations, craggles, past cares and concerns, and to just be a Holy Spirit miracle worker. And that's from love from Nuria. Well, you know that, Nuria, that uh, quote comes from the Bible, and, and in A Course in Miracles, Jesus actually clarifies that by saying that uh, what he meant by that quote in the Bible was he was saying that unless you can become as little children, meaning as dependent as infants are on their mother and their father, you cannot 
enter the kingdom of heaven. So the key words is, is being God dependent. And this is why I always talk about guidance. I mean, once you clear the channel of your mind, once you open up to the possibility of being 100% intuitive, 0% analytical, 0% uh, basing your decisions on the past. But once you just listen and follow what the Holy Spirit offers in terms of instructions, then you actually become 100% dependent on the Holy Spirit. And that's what he was meaning by, except you become as little children, was be as dependent on the Holy Spirit for all your decisions as little children, as infants are, on their mama and their papa. So what this means is basically you're going to start to give up the the analysis, you'll give up the comparisons, you're, you'll give up that way of thinking that is that says, oh, I need to figure something out. We actually don't need to figure anything out about this world. All we have to do is become very good at listening at praying and listening to the Holy Spirit. So, what, what happens when you just become dependent on the Holy Spirit is, is what seems to be like your life, it starts to feel a bit more like a fairy tale, where uh, just like when Vitruvius uh, said to Lucy, come on, let's, let's go up and go into uh, Emmett's mind, and they went up into this vast space, and, and they both went, hmm, there's not much up here. And then, uh, just when it looked like, uh, Lucy said, he, uh, basically Emmett had not had one single in original idea, Emmett started to listen as Vitruvius talked about the man upstairs, meaning God, and this giant hand appeared. And that's kind of the way the world starts to be. If you clarify your purpose and you have the desire in your heart to hear only one voice, then, then ultimately the, the mind is under the control of the prayer or the desire. So if you just keep praying, Holy Spirit, I would only hear your voice. I would hear only your voice. I would hear no other but your voice. The, that prayer actually becomes an actuality, and Jesus tells us in the workbook, he said it's actually possible to listen to only one voice throughout the day. And then he even says, without interrupting your regular activities in any way. <laughs> Can you imagine being so in tune with the Holy Spirit that none of your regular activities are interrupted in any way? But you just have this gentle presence, this gentle voice, kind of giving you a, a, a commentary or words of comfort or words of blessing, um, reminding you of your true nature. Uh, and also, when you need specific guidance, getting specific guidance. Where to go, what to do, who to see, what to say. I mean, it, there's no limit to what the Holy Spirit can provide if that dependence on that is there. Now, the ego has a whole different plan. The ego says you must provide for yourself as a person. And this is why it builds things like careers. It, it builds things like long-range plans. The Holy Spirit doesn't have long-range plans. The Holy Spirit has a holy instant plan. <laughs> and that plan is to drop into the present moment. But the ego makes many, many plans based on its past learning for what you have to do, what you should do, what you ought to do, and then it's always changing its mind. Okay, no, let's try something else. No, I don't feel good. Let's try something else. So it just wants the mind to get caught up into complexities of trying to still decide for itself of how best to spend the day, how best to, to, uh, to flow through time and space. So really your question is 
the you wanting to be like a little child is you wanting to be a, have a feeling of being cared for just like a mother cares for an infant when the mother puts her full attention on caring for the in, infant and the infant feels so loved that the infant can actually giggle and smile because they feel that they're completely cared for. That's how a, a child feels when, when there's absolute care and attention, but it also requires the trust of the infant in the parent, because <laughs> there will be no giggles unless there is a trust uh, and a dependence actually on, on a parent. So, this movie I think was very good because with all the superheroes, with all the master builders, a big part of our training and conditioning is how to grow up to be mature adults. And how many of us have tried and worked hard at trying to be mature adults? What a job! You know, I mean, and you constantly get criticized even when you give it your best effort to be a mature adult. People will say, why did you do that? They'll question your motives. They'll say, why did you waste so much of your life doing this and that? There just will be thousands of critics criticizing why you haven't turned out to be a mature adult. But you can start to say, I would rather be in a happy, peaceful state of mind, even more so than being a mature adult. <laughs> <laughs> I would rather be a happy state of mind rather than fulfilling a definition of whatever that's supposed to mean to be a mature adult. Because in the end, we have a spiritual reality and, and I find it, it just comes into an actual state of mind as you are uncompromising about following your intuition. Like Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss. And I would say, and make no exceptions to that. If, if you feel something strong within yourself, then you have to really follow that. And don't let the, the voices from the past um, try to dissuade you from following what you feel your joy is. I think the spiritual journey is nothing more than then allowing yourself to be fully inspired in this moment, and then letting everything else just take care of itself. So for me, the big change in my experience was when I quit playing the game of, uh, of future consequences. You know, I, I, I think, to be honest, I put too much weight into, and too much attention into thinking about future consequences, and then finally, Jesus was like, would you stop <laughs> with that? Uh, you know, I, I'm here with you right now, and I love you right now, and, and you can live an inspired life and, and really just let the stuff pour through you that you feel very inspired with. with as far as this movie, I think the last time I showed this movie was, uh, I showed it in 2020, I think maybe in September. And before that, I showed it uh, back when, when it came out, I think closer uh, to, to 2014, I might have done a, an audio gathering on it. But I like to see a movie for the very first time as if I've never seen the movie before. That's the only way I can watch a movie now. I have to watch a movie as if it's happening for my mind right now. And, and feel as if this is just totally for me and my lesson right now to be present, not, not about trying to uh, compare or contrast anything. So I think your, your uh, prayer, Nuria, is just, you're just praying to, to be inspired, to be totally God-dependent, to not try to feel you have to to be dependent on any person, place, thing, government, uh, any opinion of the world, but, but to just give yourself full permission to be inspired. 
and to be guided and led by by what comes to you intuitively. So thank you for for bringing that up. That's how we become as little children. <laughs> we become a very devoted follower of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So thank you. Beautiful. And I see we have um, Anna Cecilia from London for the time being, <laughs> UK. And she says, first of all, thank you, David. You cannot truly forgive when or while you still see a body, can you? Is form not to be forgiven but overlooked altogether? So there is no Lord business, no sisters, no husband, no exes, no world. It is difficult to, to grasp all these, so I ask you join me and pray to experience true forgiveness and the love of God. Thank you and lots of love. Beautiful, Anna Cecilia. Yes, it's, well, there is a part in A Course in Miracles in the text where Jesus is saying, uh, he's saying, are you then uh, to see your brother without a body? And he says, your real question should be this, instead of, Please help me see my brother, my sister, without a body. He, he reframes it and he says, this is the way the question should be put in your mind. Do I wish to see him sinless? You see? <laughs> because he knows that the body is just a concretized form of the belief in sin. So, if I believe in the sin, or we'll, we'll say the error, the error of separation, I will perceive a fragmented perception that will have different objects, different people, different places, different things. I will see a fragmented world. It's like a, it's like an ex the Big Bang. Uh, not only was there seemingly a, a Big Bang that the scientists talk about, but every day we see the explosion of images. Uh, with the Industrial Revolution, we saw an explosion of manufacturing. Now, with the advertising evolution, sometimes I just turn on the TV or the internet and I, go, I just think, oh, let's just take another peek at the explosion of images. <laughs> I, can turn, I can turn the internet on for 30 seconds or turn a television station on and just see an explosion of images. You don't even have to have the sound up. You can just see advertising is just like a flood of, of images. So what Jesus is telling us is, like he was telling us in Lesson 152, the power of decision is my own. And I can just start to pray and tell myself, uh, I forgot what to decide. I have no question. That's one of the, that's one of the beautiful uh, things that Jesus includes in his uh, rules for decision. I have no question I forgot I forgot what to decide I, I will let go of the questions so so when we hold a question in mind about the world we see a pictorial representation of that question as if we have something confronting us as a person go here or go there, or this thing versus that thing. Whenever we have a question of our identity, then we see a world that reflects our consciousness, that reflects this question of identity. The very first question that was ever asked was what Jesus says is, what am I? That was the very first question. And Christ Never ask that question. <laughs> Christ doesn't ask the question, what am I? Because Christ is a perfect creation of God. 
And Christ is certain of God's love. Christ is certain of the spirit identity. Christ is certain of, of eternal love. So, it all starts when you let the question arise in the mind. Whatever the question seems to be, it's a variation of what am I? Now, for most people, unless you're uh, Ramana Maharshi, <laughs> most people do not see it that way. Uh, Ramana did. <laughs> he actually he actually saw that that was the only question, and he had a good laugh because he saw that that was a, a that was not a real question. <laughs> but he it could be used as a device to to come back to the source. But for most people, it doesn't take the form of, of what am I? It takes this form. And here's the question that the ego always asks. Of these illusions, which do I prefer? You see? <laughs> That's the ego's only question. Of these illusions, which do I prefer? And then it tries to lure the mind into deciding which illusions are better than the others, you know, which ones are more important. And you see, it's a very sneaky trick, because once you first make that question, then it will keep asking the same question every day. Of these illusions, which do I prefer? It will ask that question day after day, and minute after minute, and moment after moment, until you finally get to the point where you say, uh, I have no question. I, I forgot what to decide. And what is it that we're deciding upon? We're, we're deciding upon the truth of, of, we're deciding upon our truth of our true identity. So that's, that's where we begin to observe the mind and we begin to observe the, the hamster wheel of, of, shifting uh, desires and preferences that go like round and round and round and round. So I think your question is is basically you you're seeing that you you don't actually have to forgive a body but you are really forgiving a way of looking a way of perceiving the world in the mind. That's what is being forgiven. Because the body is just part of what is perceived. It's just one tiny part of the perceptual world. And it seems in the ego's uh, framework to take on a much more important role. Uh, because it's the ego tries to convince the mind that that's its home. That the home is now a body. But the prayer of the heart, I think, is always the prayer to the Holy Spirit and Jesus of, please help me see this differently. Please help me see this whole cosmos differently than I have seen it, seen it in the past. Please help me see that I, I am not really capable of, of judging anything that I perceive Please help me see that comparison is impossible. Please help me see that nothing will ever be better or worse. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So thank you. Thank you. That's it. That's the practical, the practicality of this. Hmm. Well, I think those are the only two questions I see, Pete. So <laughs> it's we're coming down to a hush. <laughs> It's like a prayer in our mind, like, yes, help me rest. Let my mind rest. Let my mind accept. 
show me that there are no differences. Show me there is no appearance that is ever better or worse. What a relief! <laughs> you can feel your mind start to just sink deeper and deeper. There is no better appearance and there is no worse appearance. I was mistaken. Ah, okay. Another one has come in. Diana. Diana Rodriguez. Uh, hi, Diana, from Mexico City. It was very powerful when you told us today David, when you talked about the feeling of wanting to leave this body. Recently, I had this experience. I have dealt with an apparent overweight much of my life. My brother made me see this darkness in my mind again, feeling ashamed and desperate to be overweight again after a long time to fight with that. There have been times when I have been able to be at peace with how the body is in the present, but this anger arose again. I realized that I was angry with myself and reaches the part of tiredness of simply wanting to leave this body, not having to uh, says prenoid neck more than its appearance or existence, not maybe not having to pretend more than its appearance or existence. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Well, I think when we talk about body image and we talk about weight. There is so much conditioning that that is based on past learning that is putting in a much of an overemphasis on body image and and body weight. It's like a huge, huge ego preoccupation. And it doesn't even seem to matter what the body image is or what the weight is. But if you talk to a thousand people, they would say that they do have a string of body thoughts that roll through their mind. Not just body thoughts for one's own body, but body thoughts about other bodies too. A, a predominant um, thread of, of body thoughts. And that's why Jesus says in the Course, he says, do not raise body thoughts to the level of mind, meaning don't Give your body thoughts causation because if you believe in their reality, then you will think of yourself in terms of those body thoughts. So what he says is, give them to me. So this is a specific example when we say, hold no private thoughts. When the body thoughts rise up from the unconscious, the best thing to always do is just to give them to Jesus and say, honestly, Jesus, I don't know what how to handle these. Um, because what he's saying is, if you take responsibility for those body thoughts, you will feel guilt. Why? Because the ego made the body and the ego uses this, this stream of body thoughts to generate guilt. Too fat, too skinny, too young, too old needs to be more beautiful, needs to be less beautiful. You know, it, it's a, it's an obsessive um, string of thoughts that are always trying to just generate guilt in the mind. And <clears throat> I found for me over the years that, that the mind training that Jesus takes us into with the Course in Miracles, if you really go through those workbook lessons, he's basically saying, that 
These thoughts around the body are not your real thoughts. These are not the thoughts that you think with your Creator. And if you try to hide and protect them by repressing them, or you try to hold on to them in some way as being valuable, in either, in either direction, either trying to repress them or trying to embrace them, that, that you still will feel guilt. And the only way out of the guilt is to hand the, hand the body thoughts over to the Holy Spirit. This is a version of, of actually the Course Workbook lesson which says, What would you have me say? Where would you have me go? You know, where you're literally giving the whole idea of where a body should go and what it should say or do, and you're basically saying uh, to the Holy Spirit, Here, you direct me. I give you over this body to use as you would wish. I give you this body as a communication device. Now, if it's a communication device, the most important thing about a communication device is to let the, the Spirit communicate through it. It does not put a pressure on what the, what the device or the instrument looks like. <laughs> it's, it's the use of the instrument that brings the joy. It's not the appearance of the instrument. Uh, some of you remember, does everyone remember uh, Mother Teresa? Sweet Mother Teresa. And I remember one time, I think it was on a magazine cover, where they, they photographed her face, and there, was, there wasn't a few wrinkles. This face was, it was major. These were like wrinkles, there was thousands of wrinkles <laughs> there. And there were these peaceful eyes and this beautiful smile and this face of this woman from Albania who was up probably in her 70s and had literally thousands and thousands of wrinkles. Do you think those wrinkles kept her from, from sharing her function, from scooping people up, little babies up off, off of the, the street, from taking the poor and the homeless in? From, from loving everyone, from telling her, her nuns and her sisters, every time we meet somebody, I want you to see the face of Christ in whoever we meet. That's the kind of words that came out of that wrinkled face. Her function was not dependent on the appearance or those body thoughts around that face or the wrinkles. In fact, Jesus would laugh <laughs> to think that any of us are limited by our appearances. So, so for me, this is the answer to, to the question that you're bringing up, Diana, around, around weight. When we talk about overweight or underweight, we have some kind of artificial standard of what the, the perfect weight would be. Uh, how can you have overweight or underweight unless you have some kind of artificial standard about what that weight should be? And I would say even that ideal weight is just learned. It's just a learned concept. It doesn't really have any basis in reality. It's just a learned standard. And yet, if we hold on to that learned standard as a reality, then, then we will just judge ourselves for being overweight or underweight. And you can see how the ego, it makes up false concepts, false ideals, false standards, and then it tries to hold your mind to that standard. So, just like Jesus says, the holiest spot on earth is where an ancient hatred has become a present love. I would say the most beautiful spot in the mind is the spot of non-judgment, where we accept all things exactly as they are, without thinking things should be different than they are. That's, that's our point of safety. That's our point of healing. 
And that's also why Jesus says the Holy Spirit looks not to effects. The Holy Spirit is a way of looking on the world that is so peaceful, but that way of looking on the world is not looking at the effects, the specifics of what's going on in the world. It's just, it's a beautiful gaze of non-judgment. And that's really our goal. So I would say, Diana, that if, if these thoughts are still coming up, as best you can, just give them over to the Holy Spirit and just say, please show me the world in a different way. Please let me see the way you see. And please let me look upon the world the way that you look upon the world. And I think you'll feel very much the peace of God in your heart when you do that. Because you won't hold that, you won't hold those thoughts to be the truth. Okay, we have Andrea. Yeah, there we are, Andrea, I see. Andrea and Antonio. There they are. <laughs> Andrea writes, I have been having irritation, burning and itching in my eyelids, under my eyes for a month, and I have forgiven this each time and I watch my thoughts to surrender and expose the ego. And I have been in prayer with Antonio several times. And if I surrender this, I still feel that when the attack thought goes away, the reflection of this in the body will also go away. And if I go to the doctor, I feel that I am not trusting then I continue to forgive. Well, I think, Andrea, the first thing to say is when you start to begin to look at everything as mind, even when you experience as irritation or itching under your eyes, if you, if you just close your eyes and you pray, that is your approach, is you're just wanting to be fully present with what in my mind is irritating me. Because it right away it takes it off the body. It, it takes it off of the eyes and the eyelids. And you start to realize that that irritation of any kind is not God's will. God's will is only for perfect happiness, supreme happiness. And so, <clears throat> just like in the movie, when Emmett first was with his buddies and they were all going off somewhere and he he was kind of looking down and he saw this, he said, I, I heard a whoosh. And then he looks down and it's, it doesn't know it, but it's Lucy down there looking for the She's looking for the, the, the peace, the, the peace of resistance. And she's got a, a little thing that says it's a detector of ancient relics. So she, she's tuning in to find out where the peace of resistance is. And then when Emmett goes down, he falls down to a very deep hole and he is banged and crashes against one thing to the next, and it goes on and on and on. It's almost going down a drain pipe, way, way, way down. But when he lands, he sees this glowing piece of resistance. And then he hears the angels saying, touch the piece, <laughs> touch the piece, you see? That's like Jesus saying, end the dissociation with your resistance that deep inside you are resisting the light, you are resisting the light of heaven, and it seems like itchy eyes. <laughs> you see, it's on the surface, it seems like your eyes are itching, but if you go down deep enough into the mind, you can find that the resistance is actually to love. It's actually to redemption. And, and that's why I think it's always good when there's when there's irritation, when there's annoyance, 
when there's discomfort, it's best. I always found to, uh, I just use workbook lessons five, six, seven, eight. Lesson number five, you could use this with your itchy eyes. As soon as you feel the eyes welling up and you start to feel an itchiness, an irritation underneath your eyes, then just gently close your eyes and remind yourself, lesson five, I'm never <clears throat> upset for the reason I think. And then you can be more specific and you can say, my eyes are not itching for the reason I think, you see? So this is a good lesson because it's right away, the ego is going to tell you, you better find out what the source of this itch is. And the ego is not going to say you're afraid of God. It's, it's, it will never say that. It will say you need to go to have, maybe to a doctor to have your eyes examined. <laughs> Because it's not, it will say it's not normal to have itchy eyes. But you see, what Jesus is going to do is lesson number six. I'm upset because I see something that's not there. I'm upset because I'm seeing and feeling itchy eyes. And those itchy eyes are actually not there. <laughs> then, if you go to his next workbook lesson, number seven, I see only the past. Of course, this is what Mr. B Lord Business wants us to see is only the past. It would it would want us to use the crackle to freeze our self-image into a, an image of the past. And what Jesus is saying, that image is actually not there. It's actually, if you went deep enough, you would realize that that image is not there. And then Workbook Lesson 8 is my mind is preoccupied with past thoughts. So if you can work it to, uh, I'm never upset because of, of the reason I think. I'm upset because I'm seeing some itchy eyes that aren't really there. I see only the past and my mind is preoccupied with thoughts of itchy eyes. You see, it starts to immediately put it in more of a humorous context when you start to realize that you're you have an, a little bit of an itchy eye addiction of thoughts. You know, you're thinking about your eyes a lot, and you're thinking about the itch. And then, if you keep doing that, the ego will bring in, okay, you need to go to a doctor <laughs> and and uh, have this fixed. And what Jesus is basically saying, he he's just keeps encouraging us, come into your mind, come in here with me, and and I will, will help you, I will instruct you. There was a time when Helen Shuckman, who was the scribe of A Course in Miracles, she was at her office over at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, and suddenly she lost her eyesight. So it wasn't itchy eyes. She suddenly went from being able to see to not see. And then with some assistance, she was guided <clears throat> across the street to the neurological department uh, so that she could have her neurology, her eyes and her neuro neurology examined by a professional. And when the professional examined her eyes, the professional said, I could find nothing wrong. <laughs> so she tried that route. So then they brought her back, um, and eventually she could see again. But she was very curious, since she had a good connection with Jesus. She did, she did ask Jesus, "Why did I go blind there for for this day? Why why couldn't I see through my eyes?" And the answer that Jesus gave her was. You are afraid of spiritual sight. So she projected her fear in her mind of Christ's vision, which is not of the body's eyes, to the eyes, and then she couldn't see for a day. Even though she went over to the, the professionals, they couldn't find anything wrong with her eyes or with the neurons, the, the brain. 
but it all just got used by Jesus as a way of saying, see, you're afraid of love and you're afraid of spiritual vision because the workbook lessons are aimed at spiritual vision. You might remember, I am determined to see. Above all else, I am determined to see things differently. Those are lessons to train our mind to spiritual Christ vision. And when we have resistance, which is what we just saw in the movie, when you have a piece of resistance that's out of awareness, you need to find that piece, that piece of resistance, in order to forgive it. And the world was made up of all these false problems to distract our mind. It could be my, my eyes are itching, or my body's overweight, or um, I don't have enough money to pay my light bill. I mean, those are all three the same thing. My, my eyes are itching, I'm overweight, and I don't have enough money to pay my light bill. They seem very different, but they're all just projections of, of the resistance to know God. So I think the movie today was just encouraging because Emmett was just living his life, you know, going to work. Uh, he had his little plant. He watched his favorite TV show. He sang his favorite song. He lived in his little apartment. He even did exercises and he followed his 15 steps on how to fit in to be a good human being. And he did not realize that none of that would really make him truly happy, that he would have to discover the piece of resistance in order to set not only himself, but to set the whole world free by finding the piece of resistance. Um, sometimes Jesus does this in the workbook where he says, try to sit quietly, and he'll say like, sit quietly for like three minutes. And then he says, if you start to experience resistance, stay with it a little longer. You notice he doesn't say stop immediately. He says, when you're meditating and you experience resistance, Jesus says, stay with it for a little while. Because that's how you begin to face the resistance instead of avoid the resistance. So that's why the workbook is so helpful for going through this deep mind training. Jesus is the master psychologist, no doubt. You don't. Some people say, is it all right if I do TM meditation, transcendental meditation, uh, or can I do Kriya Yoga with the Course, or, you know, can I try this technique with the Course? And I always laugh and I say, well, you know, that doing the workbook lessons is Jesus' method of meditation. That's exactly, he's given, he, you don't need other ones to try to add in there. Just to do the workbook lessons as best as you can is literally following Jesus' prescribed meditation method. Sometimes he has your eyes open, sometimes he has your eyes closed. Sometimes he has you uh, looking around at objects, sometimes he, he doesn't. He has your eyes closed. He says, sit quietly. Uh, sometimes you can practice when your body's moving. Sometimes you can practice when your body is not moving. He's trying to transfer the meditation to everything and everyone so that in the end your mind is free from the idea that you have to be in the right position the, the right place with the right people, because <laughs> Jesus knows that that's not the case. If you practice his lessons and you transfer the training, then your, your mind is going to be free, regardless of the circumstances or the situations. So, yeah, I hope that helps. That's, and, and if, if it persists and you, you feel like, well, <clears throat> maybe I need some kind of cream or something, <laughs> then Jesus again says, sometimes when your mind is too afraid, he says you need a mix of magic and miracle. That's why even with the blind man 2,000 years ago, before he told the man to go to the, to the water and wash his eyes, Jesus spit on the ground, he made a little bit of mud, and he put little mud 
pockets on the guys on the blind man's uh the blind man was blind from birth, but Jesus put a little spit, a little bit of mud, and he's put some mud on, on the eyelids because he knew the man would be too freaked out if if he just said the word see, <laughs> you know, like with with Lazarus, rise. <laughs> he knew that it would be too frightening for the man, the blind man, if he just said see now. So he he made a, a little spit on the ground, he put a little mud on it, and then he said, now go wash in the in the pool over there. And the guy followed the instructions, he went over, he washed the mud off of his eyes, and he could see. You see, Jesus was giving him a little time, a little more of a gentle way, you know, so he could put some of it onto the mud and some of it onto the water, instead of see now, you see? Because when the mind the mind chooses a symptom, it's chosen the symptom itself. Jesus wasn't healing anybody, he was simply aligning them with the mind of God and saying, you can let go of this uh, symptom that you chose. So it was really the, the mind let go of the blindness in the presence of the Christ light. It wasn't that Jesus, the man, healed the blind man, it's more of just the presence of love, the presence of God is always the healer. But Jesus is saying, if you're too afraid, then, then it's okay, use some magic and miracles together. Because that's what you need. You're too afraid to accept the healing. And he does say, no one can thrust healing on anyone. You have to be ready. Uh, even the people who were lame, who walked, the mind had to be ready. Even the blind man who could then see, he had to be ready. Even Lazarus, who was in the grave and dead in grave clothes, the mind had to be ready to accept the Christ light in order to come, come out of that crypt. <laughs> so, so nothing is thrust on us. We, we always have to, to choose to join with the light for there to be healing. There's, there's no, uh, there really are no external factors. It's just a decision in the mind. But you can't force yourself. You have to, you have to be very gentle. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. And Mary Straub. Hi, David. Fantastic movie and commentary. Will you please clarify the difference in positive thoughts like I will be happy and rules for decision. I want to have a happy day. Love the way you make me laugh at this world, exclamation. Well, rules for decision when Jesus is saying, decide the kind of day that you want when you say, I want a happy day, he's always saying to start your day with a decision of what you want. And the second one that you mentioned is, I want to be happy. Happy is not, is not a partial quality. So it's not like you can say, I want to be happy if there's a part of your mind that doesn't want to be happy. So what Jesus says in the in the workbook, I believe it's, he says, the, to say the words, I want the peace of God, is different than to mean the words, I want the peace of God. You see, there's a difference between speaking it and meaning it. And he makes a distinction in the course, in the workbook, between those two. So, to say, I want to be happy, or I want to have a happy day, in the words, is one thing, and then to mean it. And what he's teaching us through the workbook is, if we really want to be happy, we have to relinquish self-doubt. We have to relinquish self-criticism. We have to relinquish opinions. We have to relinquish judgment. Because 
to truly want to be happy is to just accept things exactly as they are. And the ego is giving us a whole different story. It's telling us, well, here's some things that we need to work things out in form, <laughs> you know. I want to be with the right people, I want to be in the right place, whatever that would be, or the right circumstances. So we're used to thinking with the ego's judgments and circumstances of what's better. I'll be happy when my life looks this way, or I'll be happy when I have these outcomes. Um, I remember many years ago listening to a Mary Ann Williamson uh, lecture, and she was she was saying in the lecture that after she'd gone out on a date with this guy, a first date with this guy, she got back and she had given this guy her phone number. And she sat there on her couch looking at the phone, uh, waiting for the phone to ring. And in her mind came the thought, do I want him to be happy or do I want him to call? <laughs> you see? See how practical this is. She wanted this guy that she was date, had gone on a date with so much to call that she kept looking at the phone and waiting for him to call her. And she put more of an emphasis on the call than wanting him to be happy, than just saying, what a beautiful first date. I God, I want this man to be happy. You see, that's one way to go at it. And the other way is, I want him to call. And, and you see there's an expectation there, because guess what? If he doesn't call, she's not going to be happy. <laughs> she's, she's waiting for that call. So that was one of the things I heard in one of her lectures. Do I want him to be happy or do I want him to call? That's actually a very good teaching device because the first one doesn't have any expectations tied in it. If I want him to be happy, that is sincerely my wish. I want him to be happy, Holy Spirit. I wish happiness on this man. But the second one is an expectation. I want him to call me. And, and that's a really good teaching device because when we want an outcome to happen, like a call, we really have given away the power of our mind to the outcome. And we're basically saying, I'll be happy when he calls. <laughs> And it, hey, listen, if this guy doesn't call me in three days, there's no second date, you know, like that's it. It's off. <laughs> you see how the mind will, will set up conditions for it instead of just, I will for him to be happy. I want him to be happy. And I think that's what Jesus meant by pray for your enemies, you know, because Jesus is telling us in the Song of Prayer, he says, if you have enemies, you have great need of prayer. <laughs> the way only Jesus can tell us. If you have enemies, you have great need of prayer. Meaning, if you have enemies, you need to pluck those, those thoughts from your mind. Because God didn't create enemies. And if you, want, if you want to believe you have enemies, then you're trying to believe something that God doesn't know about. And so you need to pluck those enemy thoughts from your mind. So I I think your question is very profound, Mary, because basically you're asking for what is it that makes the, 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 the words, I want to be happy, what is it that makes them important? And it's the genuine prayer of the heart that's underneath the words. So when you say, I want to be happy with your whole heart, then your mind is the Christ mind. It's so powerful that it's more powerful than actually anything else in the universe. It's more powerful than the laws of physics and chemistry. It's more powerful than the, than the weather. It's more powerful than, than the laws of gravity, than the laws of time and space. The mind is so powerful that when you say and mean, I want to be happy, 
There is nothing in the world that has the power to make you feel unhappy because the mind is that powerful. It's the Christ mind. There's really only one mind because some people say, well, what if what if my neighbor's mind is more powerful than my mind? <laughs> and I'm like, well, the problem is there's not there's not a neighbor's mind and, and a my mind. It's just one mind. But that's what lesson 152 is. The power of decision is my own. If I, in mind, choose to be happy, and that is my sole prayer, to know God's will for perfect happiness, then there's nothing that can stop me from being happy. But if I want something else and I want to be happy, I want to be happy and something else, that's where the problem comes in. And at least Mary Ann said, do I want to be happy or do I want him to call? She basically knew that she was making a distinction between the two. And that's actually very important because to call is an expectation and and the prayer for happiness has no expectation tied in with it. It's just a pure prayer from the heart. So thank you, Mary. I'm glad you enjoyed enjoyed the movie. It's a little change of pace here after a Man of God and some of the other ones. You know, we got some pretty intense ones. Mahalia. So thank you all. I'm so glad we got to spend the time together. It was a, a privilege and an honor, and uh, 